good afternoon. I think we're just about to hit 12. So um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this panel. Uh, we're going to be speaking about initial coin offerings and security token offerings. Um, so just let me begin um, and, and set this up for, for everyone. So 2017 was touted the year of ICOs, and it was when the craze took off and companies, you know, raising record-breaking amounts of money um, as high as 257 million in just a short amount of time that was Filecoin. Um, so that, that's what happened in 2017. Then came the regulatory clampdown in 2018 where lawsuits were filed and, and tokens were deemed securities. Um, and then emerged security token offerings um, and, and it, it came out as a more legitimate way to raise money, and now, now there are uh, security token marketplaces and exchanges. Um, so joining me on the panel today, I'll, I'll introduce them once uh, again, um, to discuss kind of where we are at uh, in, in terms of the sentiment around ICOs and STOs is, um, I'll start from my uh, left, um, Yale Tamar, the CMO of uh, SolidBlock. You just heard from her partner before, or, or her advisor. Um, uh, so SolidBlock, as you just heard, is a new fundraising vehicle offering a compliant global platform for the issuance and trade of digital securities backed by real estate and other assets. And then we have Jerome uh, Tiche, the, the Tiche, sorry, the director of uh, Consensus Solutions in France. Um, he's also the founder and president of Ethereum France, which is the largest uh, blockchain-oriented nonprofit in France. Um, and then we've got Dr. Daniel Dimas, a partner and head of blockchain EMEA for PwC Strategy and. Um, Dr. Dimas is also a co-founder of, of Swiss Finance and Technology Association and the Crypto Valley Association, so welcome. Um, so let's begin. Um, where is the ICO, uh, with where the ICO and STO trend is today? So I mean, Daniel, um, just to, to kick us off, you know, what is your assessment of, of the trend today and the overall development of ICOs and STOs? Yeah, thank you, Samantha. I think we're in a very interesting phase of this whole development. As you said, in 2017, we all remember um, there was a huge craze and basically a lot of startups found a good way to get a lot of money without doing actually much for it in terms of fundraising. Um, what we've seen is, and we're actually covering this every six months with a study, the first one we did in mid-2017, so we're kind of close at the pause of it. There was quite uh, not much happening during the so-called crypto winter, uh, which ended, uh, I'd say, this May. Uh, I'm sure you all followed that very closely. Uh, and since then, we've seen some real positive pickup and I think it's positive because we don't have that craze from 2017 where basically startups with just a clumsy white paper, no business plan, no real assets behind it, uh, just were raising money. I mean, most of the ICO projects that I look at are, are you know, pretty fundamentally well thought through, well prepared, a lot of work going into that. And that's just the ICOs. We've also seen the IEOs, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, people got the idea what uh, used to be common in IPO when you do an IPO, you go to an exchange and you launch it there usually, and the same happened with the ICOs. So we've seen some very interesting ICO, IEOs, I mean the Bitfinex being one of that. And then uh, of course we're sitting here not because of those two things, but we're sitting here for the STOs. And mm -hmm. the securities token offerings definitely going to be um, even more interesting, even more disruptive, and it's going to change the business landscape much more because it's not just a way to make crowdfunding and raise money for something but it's a way to actually, yeah, as we just heard from, uh, from the previous speech, for example, in real estate, you can create tokens that actually have a underlying asset value. Yeah, so um, real estate is actually a, um, you know, an interesting industry that, um, you know, makes sense for STOs. So, I mean, Yale, uh, it'll be great to hear from you um, and for uh, you to give us an overview of kind of the industries um, that benefit most from ICOs and STOs as well. Okay, absolutely. So both ICOs and STOs are just new fundraising vehicles. Now the name of the game for ICOs right now is uh, regulation, accountability, and transparency. Now the reason for this ICO craze that we discussed was the fact that a lot of people for two or three years prior made a lot of money with cryptocurrencies. So for them it was basically kind of throwing money into projects, 
uh, doing minimal due diligence, kind of liking, I like the idea, I feel like I'm in a casino, I'm gonna invest in 30 projects and hope that not all of them are scams. So that was basically 2016, 2017. Now in 2018, those people kind of already invested and traditional, more traditional investors came in, right? The accredited investors, some retail investors that understood the potential. And that's when the ICO market has entered the winter because everybody understood that most of these projects were not valid. Now, STO was born out of this trend because we need a better vehicle where investors' money will be protected and backed by actual assets. Now, when we're looking at actual assets, what are these, right? So there are several types. There are physical, and then there's also digital assets, and then there's intellectual property. So when we look at physical assets, we can look at real estate. This is the most obvious use case for STOs, is when you have real assets, which are either land, or building, or maybe even a long-term lease agreement. So those are assets. Now, when you look at more digital assets, like an intellectual property, like, uh, for, for example, pharmaceutical patents, or a, formu a formulation for, I don't know, a CBD derivative, or it could be um, just some sort of an intellectual asset that's not even you know, written down or patented. So we could have those appraised, for example, art, right? And finally, you could have a very traditional business, like a manufacturing business with a factory line, uh, with uh, machinery, you know, all of these are real assets and you can apply STOs there. Now, I think that real estate is really at the forefront of this because of number one, valuation. It's much easier to value than almost any other assets. And number two, because it's a very, very basic um, asset for investment, almost, 50% um, of population in the developed world own real estate, um, and a lot, of, a lot of people don't, and they want to get access to it. So that's where STOs are really, really attractive, mm -hmm. is to give access to these investors where there is already a demand. We're just creating a new asset class that will make the same type of investment more available to everybody. Cool. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, so, Jerome, um, you know, so Yale touched on that, you know, STOs and ICOs are used to raise money uh, for startups. Um, I mean, it, it, they're, they're, they're two different fundraising methods, but, you know, the, the one thing they have in common is blockchain technology. Um, so do you think that STOs and ICOs are, are good ways to raise money, and, and what are the considerations um, companies need to take? Um, so about the, the trends that... Uh uh, David and Yael underlined, I completely agree. Um, but specifically for startups, um, I think that you can see, when you consider the startup model where you have like a seed round where you agree, well, you raise some money, you agree on some milestones, and then you commit on accumulating uh, recurring monthly revenue, and then when you have consumed 60 to 70% of your funds, you go back to the investor and tell them like, well, look, uh, my valuation is um, 10x, and I'm now raising this, and I'm I want to raise more and you'll be locked for two, two years or three years and, and again and again and the valuation ingredient and so on. Um, this model is a little bit in opposition with the ICO style when you say like, well, I want to raise uh, 20 million, 15 million, whatever million I can raise and um, then I will give you a token and the token will have value. Uh, so that's the ICO model and when you want to apply the startup model to STO saying like I'm uh, doing my seed round and I'm offering you uh, shares that will be securities and you will be able to trade them, you will be able to transfer them. Well, anytime someone that hold a uh, security token that represents a share from a startup and that he is able to sell it to you, for example, that's a liquidity event that changed the valuation of your startup. So kind of in opposition with how the startup model work where you are locked and then we reevaluate based on the RMR, um, recurring monthly revenue, and right. then you raise again. So it's complicated for uh, entrepreneurs with we've been doing startups to just say like, hey, I want to do my seed run on a security token because the main narrative we had so far with security token was, oh, it's, it's liquid, you can transfer them. And eventually uh, it also costs less, but it turns out like since we don't have that many experience of tokenizing uh, real assets, uh, we still have to pay for high legal fees or 
high technical fees. I don't know what your price is, or well, I can tell you what the price of consensus uh, technical partnering is. But you know, we have to pay for it for those. So it's it's not there yet. Um, but I, I do believe that we are past the ICO craze. It's going to be uh, super complicated to get back to do properly ICOs. Um, well, so, someone named Matthew Leibovitz came up with this quadrilemma that. Uh, I think is very interesting. If you want to do an ICO, and an ICO uh, means that you are creating a, uh, a public good that the token holder will share and accept to pay for with the token, uh, you have to figure out four problems. The first one is how you're going to distribute this token equally and broadly, because mm -hmm. the bigger the community you have, uh, the better the public good is shared. And also, second problem, you have to make sure that you engage with this community, that you keep it vibrant, and you attract talent to develop the thing. And third problem, which kind of get into opposition with the, the two first problem, you have to raise enough to actually deliver. And in the blockchain technology, it's not easy to know exactly how much it's going to cost and what the technical hurdles you're going to face when you develop. And now we have a false problem, <laughs> which is it has to be regulatory compliant. Mm. So utility token, security token, what is considered a security? What is a utility? Can you raise here? Can you raise there? It's super complicated, and now we are in a trend that we are trying to sell securities because everybody understands the security. If a regulator say, my security is this, you have to comply that way. And if you comply the security way in the US, in the Europe, and so on, you may be able to distribute globally. Right. So, I mean, you touched you know, on the fact that we're well past ICOs, and that brings me to kind of my second point um, and discussion point here is, you know, are ICOs still a thing today? Um, I mean, you say we're, we're gone past it, but maybe Daniel Yale, do you want to chime in on? Yeah, I, because I'm aware that there are still some ICOs rolling out today, and also, yeah, what's happened to the ones that have launched, that have tokens, and yeah, are we seeing any in it? So I think that ICOs, and the reason why we all got so excited about ICOs, you know, a few years back, it is an amazing, financial model, you know, very innovative, if properly executed within proper regulatory constraints, right? So infrastructure projects that came out of ICOs, uh, created blockchain infrastructure, smart contracts are obviously valid and amazing. You know, we've seen in Israel projects like Orbs and Bancor and, you know, uh, um, Ethereum, EOS, and uh, Tezos, and, and others, you know, obviously all have ecosystems, all have um, projects, uh, dApps, and so on, right? So, so that's an example of successful projects. It's true that's less than 1% of all of the money raised, right? Um, or all of the projects launched. Uh, in terms of what's happening right now, there are a few ICOs, quite a few ICOs happening, especially many IEOs, um, and I actually like IEOs because there is a level of transparency there and there are a level of accountability, due diligence done by these exchanges that issue tokens. So I like that. And um, there are some examples of, uh, of uh, industries where uh, you can actually have a valid, valid utility token. One of them is ecosystems, creating open source ecosystems. For example, you know, supply chain systems for you know, transferring information. So that's a good example of where um, utility tokens make sense. Also green energy, where you mm -hmm. share benefits from generating energy, you share, benef you, you share incentive, you create incentives everywhere where you want to incentivize users to do certain behaviors. And I've seen uh, quite a few ICOs that, um, uh, that are out now that are doing that. So uh, I believe that there, there is a place for ICOs there. It's more difficult because you have to prove you're not a security. Yeah. And I think, my personal opinion, is that to raise initial funds, one should, do, one should use an STO model and then you know, issue a utility token to facilitate exchanges within an ecosystem. So I would say ICOs should migrate into equity financing or security financing and then issue a hybrid token or utility token uh, to facilitate an ecosystem. Yeah. I, would, I would add probably two, two more layers of pain to that, and I fully agree with what you just said. Um, when I speak with corporate clients, you know, real, I mean, I work for PwC in a strategy, so I, I have a lot to do in the boardrooms at CEOs. Um, they, they fundamentally don't understand what this ICO was all about, so for them it's just a scam thing or just, you know, 
a, a few people who got lucky, made a few millions, and went off to Ibiza or Cyprus or Crete and just had a blast, right? And, and kudos to them for doing that. Um, but fundamentally, for a corporation, the current model of doing an IPO on a stock exchange, this is a very, I would say, isolated thing because they usually address a very sophisticated group of financial investors. Most of the IPOs are kind, kind of pre-sold. So it's not really energizing millions of people around the world. This is something that ICOs actually manage quite well. If you look uh, in these many Telegram forums where you know, startups come out of nowhere, they start the craze, they have community managers, they make some hype before the ICO. Um, this is good social media marketing. This is good energizing, inspiring people. And I recommend actually my corporate clients to look into that. Of course, not maybe for their main share of the company, obviously, but they may have, I don't know, a loyalty coin. They may have some utility coin that they could use in their company for whatever. Uh, and, and if they manage uh, to actually issue those on a ICO, even large corporations could look into that. So I'm not, I would not do the mistake of declare this thing dead just because the SDO is coming now. Uh, I don't. I think, like you said, there will be use cases for ICOs in the future, and maybe it will not just be the startups actually using them for fundraising, but maybe big corporations will decide um, to issue them. I have one specific example. I mean, you, do you know what V bucks are? V bucks. Anyone familiar with V bucks? No. V bucks. Fortnite. Okay, there's one Fortnite player here in the in the audience. <laughs> right. uh, no one else is playing Fortnite, uh, but but so you know gaming. you know how Fortnite works, right? And how V Bucks work. Yeah. It's a in-game currency yep. that has a huge demand in the whole world. I mean, millions of people are playing that game every day. And and V Bucks is an in-game currency that you have to get through fiat. So you have to have an interface. And, and acquire these uh, tokens, their tokens, and then you can buy, you know, skins and, and gadgets and things, music, uh, different elements in the game. Um, maybe in the future, and a lot of these game platforms, and, and I think we're also here beyond the, the stage where this is just, you know, games for kids. But I mean, you saw, you see the esport movements, particularly in Asia. This is becoming a multi million if not billion uh, dollar business and i could imagine at one point all these companies league of legends and fortnite and so on and epic and riot games um, so far they try to you know close them down and say oh we're monolithic you can only buy the v bug inside but maybe in the future they'll think a bit broader and say well it actually makes sense to issue this more broadly energize people and give people also the pro possibility to trade these v bucks etc and of course game developers will tell me now oh, that's crap we don't want that because it creates secondary markets but i think in the future it's not just going to be about real estate and and gold and silver and all these physical assets all these virtual assets in-game currency future rights there's a really cool startup in the crypto valley called utopia um, you should Google their websites. I mean, what they do is they're actually former DJs from the music industry who earned a lot of money. But they said, as a musician, you get constantly screwed with the, your loyal royalties, right? You need to get the royalties in all the countries around the world where your music is being played. If you're successful and it's being played in many places, you can imagine the admin effort for that. And they say sometimes it takes you two, three years to get paid, but you probably only get a fraction, maybe just half of what you actually should get. And, and in the, the Utopia is trying to tokenize music rights, link it with a real-time engine that says, okay, now in Athens, in that club, that new song is played, and boom, the token gets released to the artist a second later. I um, mean, this is their vision. It's called Utopia. It's probably a bold vision, but I really like it because that could also pave the way forward to see completely new forms of tokens about future revenue streams. Uh, a smart student at the University of Nicosia, she could just say, well, I'm starting in my first semester here. Um, I need some money for you know, my lifestyle as a student. I'm putting my future revenue streams as a business professional here offering to, to sell that, and, and people could invest. And, and there will be a lot of creativity around this, and I'm really very positive and excited about the future that we will see around not just tokenizing hard stuff and hard materials that we already have, but maybe even new virtual assets in the future. Jerome, you want to add um, to this? Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> about, about scams, um, 
Let's, let's just look at what we, what, where we came from, like in 2016, when we started to mm -hmm. do the first ICOs, like uh, Augur, Gnosis, and the, the first ones that did uh, use this model. Like back in these days, we were like, okay, let's deploy a smart contract, like the, the, um, the speaker just right before us explained, like you deploy your smart contract, you send your crypto, so your Ether, or eventually your Bitcoin, but it's tricky, but just send your Ether and you're gonna raise a token. So we have a smart contract, smart contract, these are really smart and these are really contract, but it's something deployed in the Ethereum blockchain and you can look at it. So when you say one Ether, you get this amount of token. So that was transparent, yet not really compliant because we didn't do any KYC on the people that were sending the funds. We didn't do any, uh, any AML and so on. But as an investor, I know that I put one Ether, I get 100 token or something. And I know that this project has raised this amount of money. And now this project is like, yeah, well, I know I raised this money and I have this token, so I'm gonna try to be listed on an exchange. And then eventually the token gets liquidity, you may make some money of speculation and so on, or wait and use the product. But we went from this to uh, started to do KYC because the regulators was asking us, starting to start to cash in also fiat uh, um, instead of crypto. And we started to put away this transparency that we advocated initially, uh, which makes it actually quite difficult to exactly know how much money was raised by each project, how, was, how many tokens were actually emitted, and then we go to the exchange. So the last uh, ICOs that went on, they went with a private sale, a pre-sale, eventually a public sale, and eventually also an exchange listing. So why not just package it all in one and do an initial exchange offering? Uh, so I really don't think it, it's makes the, it makes the investor comfortable on this. Right. Uh, it's really complicated to figure out if this is going to be a good project, if this thing is going to be uh, listed and, and growing, or if it's going to be a product at some point. Right. Uh, so I was, I was really expecting a trend that I haven't seen happening yet, which was that the tokens will migrate to a security model saying like, well, we are running out of funds, so maybe we can convert the, the token that we emitted to a proper share of our company. And so far, um, I've heard of some people uh, thinking about it, but I haven't seen, to my knowledge, that anyone has tried to do that, and I hope that someone will do uh, at some point. And I'm really glad to see emerging this new model that you talk about, to talk about with the, um, the hybrid models where you have a security token basically for the infrastructure saying like, well, we're going to have validators. So you can buy a share and be a validator or, or some sort. And then we have the utility token that the user will share. So you can invest in both the infrastructure and eventually the usage, which will probably make it more easy to, un to understand from, for the regulator. Actually, to comment on that, um, one, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is before the token generation event, you know, when you announce your ICO, announce your STO, and you start raising money, you have a soft cap and you have a hard cap. Let's say your soft cap is $10 million, your hard cap is $20 million. Now you raised a million, two million, three million. Until you, you get to the soft cap, this money is not guaranteed. It will be returned, right? So the contract that's used before you generate the tokens, before you reach a soft, soft cap, is called SAFT, right? Which is basically a simple agreement for future token. Now, a lot of companies are thinking about issuing the SAFT with a provision that, you know, if the ICO doesn't work out, if you don't have a utility token, at the end of the day, this will be converted to equity. And that's what investors are asking for. And so when we're uh, talking to our clients at SolidBlock, we're saying, okay, well, we can actually generate interesting models in which you have, you know, uh, uh, even security tokens that can, in certain cases, be converted straight to equity. So they're different. This is a really flexible model in the, in the end of the day that you can, you can implement to make investors feel better. Now, I've read that the, the next trend really is going to be exchanges that are going to facilitate the whole issuance. One package, what you have with IPOs, you know, you generate a token in a place where it's going to be traded and also consolidation of exchanges. There's no reason why there should be thousands and, or, uh, of exchanges out there. And the third trend is the traditional stock exchanges, and you've seen that already with Deutsche Börse, for example, that announced that they're going to be issuing and trading security tokens. Uh, a lot of traditional exchanges have patented solutions or have acquired 
market players in order to trade security tokens. So I think the biggest players that will emerge in the near future for security token issues of trade are going to be these traditional exchanges. Right. Well, I mean, before looking at the, the next trends, I think, um, you know, security token offerings were, you know, labeled as the next game changer after ICOs. So, I mean, going on to our, our third talking point, you know, um, have SCOs taking off, or, or, or and will they? Um, and, and where are they right now? So let's talk more about security token offerings right now and, and, and the ecosystem at the moment. So I'll, I'll just continue where, where you are left. And, and by the way, Switzerland did it even before Deutsche Börse. So you may have heard that the Swiss stock exchange, SIX, has launched the SDX project. Uh, it's also, they have a website. And they've been now uh, working on this for quite some time. They had to delay the launch. They should have launched, I think, earlier this year. They're still working on it. It's going to very likely be launched next year. So then that exchange will be open for business. As the name says, they don't want to trade Bitcoins on their exchange. It's going to be only for security token offerings. And mm -hmm. like any old traditional stock exchange, you have to be a registered member of that exchange if you want to trade on it. So it's not just open for the public. It's not like Kraken and, and, uh, and uh, the crypto uh, exchanges. And I think that's a very interesting development, but at the same time, it kind of answers your question, you know, why hasn't STOs really kicked off? I mean, if you if you care to look at our, our reports, which we do every six months, you can download them for free, of course, in the internet, PwC, ICO, STO report, and, and boom, you have it. Um, we looked at STOs, I think, six or 12 months ago, and we found that they have been already been issued. So this is not all the, the world waiting for the STOs. I think there are around 30, 40 successful STOs already happened. But of course, in, in very local regional setups, because mind you, not all global regulations in each country are prepared for STO. So as you know, before has been said here on stage and the Liechtenstein Act was presented, some countries have done their homework and they're ready to operate with digital assets and STOs and some haven't. And as long as this is not going through, there will be no global proliferation of STOs. This is a very important challenge we need to overcome. And, and the reason that there are no established exchanges out there ready for the STO will hold a lot of the corporations back because Yes, there are seven, 800 cryptocurrency exchanges in the world, but for many corporations, they wouldn't accept them as a proper legal counterparty for various reasons. We don't need to go into that, but they would not accept them. So they are all waiting, and I'm, I'm sitting on projects where clients came to us seven months ago, and they said, yeah, we're going to launch our token on the SDX when they go live in summer. They didn't go live, so a lot of projects are stuck in the pipeline. So the moment we have three, four global, globally attractive exchanges in Switzerland, Germany, maybe in other places, you will see a lot of projects that are currently in stealth mode in the pipeline just waiting. They're all going to flush out. It's going to be super exciting. Jerome, it'll be good to hear your, your angle on why STOs haven't taken off. Uh, because of the regulators. The regulators, <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> now, what, what, you, what you mentioned is uh, also an interesting trend, but I, I have all... I've, I have trouble wrapping my head around this because like, it seems like it's the same old model with an extra blockchain step. Uh, so the value proposition is n not super clear, um, but at least it's an alternative. Like, okay, you have, you have the same old thing, but in a blockchain way, so you can expect better service as time will go. But the, f the, f the fact that we still have the same model to apply, I mean, the number of intermediaries, the AML, the KYC, uh, the verification, the hurdles with making your revenue recognized to tax also uh, the revenue from those assets, um, the, the, the regulation is still not ready uh, to cut some of those steps to make it really proficient for the blockchain, to make sure that well, like for, for example, in, in France, we have uh, um, we the, the the Minister of Economy vowed to make France a blockchain nation, but now the local SEC, the IMF, is considering what it is to be a service provider for crypto assets. What does it mean? Like you have different level of uh, of, of services. You are a custodian. You are uh, doing crypto to crypto. You are doing crypto to to um, to fiat and so on. And defining what a custodian is, or from a blockchain perspective, is a headache for them. 
Like, do we consider people that run the network? Do we consider people that run the smart contract? Or do we consider people that run the keys? Who owns what? Who, who, who is just in charge of what? And uh, until we have uh, inside the regulator practice a way of saying, if you are in the legacy system, you apply this regulation. Like in, in Europe, you have uh, uh, the, the financial regulation that uh, everybody has to, uh, has to comply with. And on the other side, if you are in a blockchain, well, then we apply this type of regulation because we can be lighter since we have transparency and eventually we also have control over the ledger itself, for example. Um, yeah. Once we would but have he, that... Here I have to, to, because we should make it a bit controversial, I think that <laughs> idea that you have is illusionary and will never happen. So it is really, as you said, STOs are the old world coming in with a fancy blockchain t-shirt, but it's still the old <laughs> world. So I don't think, and we've heard that by Scott very early in the morning, that we should kind of yeah, praise Satoshi Nakamoto, but kind of also embrace what's next. And this idea, and this is a very fundamental discussion here that was maybe not planned for the panel, this idea of creating a parallel world of financial services in the world through Bitcoin and maybe other cryptocurrencies, I think it has failed. It has failed now with the FATF cracking down, the regulators, the central banks issuing their own cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera. The, it is very hard to establish a parallel universe in cryptocurrencies. Probably it will still continue living. But if we think that we can do the same with securities, establish a secondary layer or financial services market in the world, tokenize securities that is decoupled from the from the today's traditional old school securities it's not it's never going to happen because securities in their very definition are regulated locally or in the eu by the eu etc and and all these regulators they're not going to give up they're not gonna, just going to say oh yeah it's fine we're not going to regulate it because it's a token we're just going to do the old school stuff no they're just going to say and this is what we want we want a token to be accepted and recognized and valuable like a real security so if i tokenize a share or a real estate um, i want this to be the real thing i don't want this to be a, a colored coin pointing at a safe in the safe is a paper document that is the real document i want this to be real and if we want this to be real we have to tango we have to tango with the regulators we have to go through a painful amount of years to get together I don't see a second way. Uh, Yale, did you want to add to this? Yeah, well, I have a different view from my esteemed colleagues. What do you mean the STO market hasn't taken off? I mean, really, there are over a billion dollars that was tokenized in this year alone. I think that the projections last year were delusional. Somebody said that the STO market is going to be worth $30 billion. But their view was skewed by the success of the ICO right. in 2017 and 2018. Now, if you look at the history of ICO, let's say 2013 was the first ICO that came out and raised $3 million, right? Then we kind of had ICO slowly gaining traction. And then in 2017, 2018, we saw $4 billion raised, right, by block one. You know, now in this industry, we have to look obviously at the regulatory hurdles, at awareness, you know, all, all of these things. And yet we managed to raise collectively over a billion dollars. Now, just over the past week, you know, I get millions of <laughs> millions. I get hundreds of people sending me articles about tokenization in Japan. Harbor tokenized the hundred million dollars just now, you know, all, just real estate tokenizations. And all the equity tokenizations we don't hear about because they don't make the news. Right. So Solid Block tokenized 18 million dollars worth last year, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, for, As for Aston Coin, uh, a real estate backed token um, for a Marriott hotel. So there are many, many use cases and I think this industry has taken off yes. and it's gonna take off big time. Um, you know, I predict we're gonna reach probably maybe around 10, 10 billion and then in the next um, even you know, two, three years or even faster. Um, one thing that we all really need to work hard on is to bring institutional investors in this um, equation and to create tools such as analytics, reports, and that's actually something where Solid Block really focused on is to make this as useful to the regular analysts at JP Morgan's of the world to evaluate security tokens as they would their regular, you know, real estate assets, so that they get in, and then you're gonna see takeoff big time. 
Yeah, so I don't want to sound pessimistic in this. I'm, I'm very optimistic on STOs. We did, a, we did a first emission with a real estate fund in France uh, last, last month, five weeks, five weeks ago for 30 million. So it was a first and we have more in the pipeline. We see traction, definitely. Um, not as much as we were expecting also because we were looking at this from an ICO point of view for sure. And uh, I'm willing to take the bets, uh, David, on the having two parallel systems living together at some point, specifically in Europe, um, because from the European uh, Union perspective, we have this objective of creating a unified capital market in Europe. So it's been an objective for years, for decades, and we're still not even getting there. And blockchain is offering a way of doing that in a very interesting manner. So I, I hope and I, I, I bet that at some point we will have a shared uh, blockchain sandbox to uh, actually do European regulated uh, security offerings or security token listing. And uh, this will come with the, uh, with the oversight of the multiple regulators that will come together and say like, well, okay, we, we can do this. One of the sponsors of this, uh, of this conference, uh, BeatShares has done uh, things like this uh, with, uh, with uh, also the, uh, the, the Maltese, the, 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 the French, the, the Italians are looking at it, the Germans are looking at it. So I think we can all come together and say like, well, we have this sandbox and you get to do your security token offering on this, educate yourself and educate ourselves all together and eventually converge with a, 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 a working system at European level. Well, I think we have to come together. There will no, not be a parallel securities world acceptable by most of the... I mean, look at the exchanges that are now uh, gearing up, Deutsche Börse, Börse Stuttgart, SDX. They are crystal clear what they're going to do. They're not going to create a secondary market infrastructure layer or anything. They're going to play by the rules as set forth by EU, FINMA, and all the other regulators, the SEC in the US, and they're just going to blockchainize the infrastructure, which will be more efficient, which will have gains on the PNL side, but they're definitely not there to establish a second world. And I don't want to be the bad guy on the, on, the, on the panel. I hate that role, but I mean, I still think it hasn't kicked off because I'm sorry, one billion is nothing, right? I mean, in the wider scheme of things, whether we tokenize a billion or two or three, it's nothing. It doesn't change. You won't even get the attention of a mid-sized company CEOs if you go to them and say, oh, last year globally we tokenized a billion, two billion, I mean, this is nothing. Um, and that's the problem. And in our ICOSU report in 2017, which was the crazy year, I mean, uh, we, it was like nine billion. Last year, 2018 was actually the peak because if you remember, we had two quite big uh, ICOs, you know, the EOS one and we had the Telegram one. So, I mean, we really spent a lot of time cracking down on, on numbers and, and creating facts because a lot of the discussions are often, you know, not really fact-based. So, 18 was the, was the best year, but it was only 20 billion. This year, until summer, we, we had a total of ICOs, STOs, IEOs, and even DICOs of 3.3 um, billion. I will present the numbers in the afternoon. Um, and maybe since then, we added maybe another 2, 3 billion if we're positive. That gives us a total of 6 billion issued um, on the blockchain this year. It's it's not good, it's not enough, right? I think the moment you can add an, an, a zero or even a second zero to that, and we're talking 200 billion uh, tokenized, then we're talking, then everyone will listen, then the regulators will listen, the BIS in Basel will gonna listen. Um, so we're still in, in our starting blocks, but I'm very positive, I'm saying this will happen, but it will take a few years. It will not take one year, not two years, it will probably take even longer, because corporations are slow moving, they go take things to the board, they make decisions there. So it will take minimum three plus years until we see a wide pickup of the STO. But the good news is once there is a wide pickup, up, a lot of big companies will join the party. Um, you may like that or you may not. Some people will say, oh, now they're, now they're spoiling the party. We had so much fun. It was just us. It was the cool community. Now a lot of people in suits going to show up. Yeah and maybe this conference in three years' time will have a very different you know, demographic, we don't know. Um, but I think that's gonna happen eventually, and it's, it's inevitable, if we want that. Of course, we can say, nah, let's, um, but then the STO thing is never gonna take off.
So I just want a bit of time uh, for questions at the end, but I just want to kind of um, wrap this conversation up and, and look, say, ahead in 2020. You know, what's to come for the year ahead? So I mean, Daniel, that was really good that you you're saying that we're still several years away from this really taking off, but what, what can we expect kind of 2020, you know, two months time? My main uh, world, I guess, is China. So okay. I'm gonna leave you with that. Um, China is, you know, the largest country in the world, seems to be very crypto friendly. Um, I think it's, it might lead the, uh, you know, even the STO world, depending on how things go. You know, big countries uh, with populations that you know, get richer and richer in Asia uh, is always it always is one of the leading markets in in the space in the crypto space, um, and I foresee some institutions starting to come in come into the space. So 2020 um, Ethereum 2.0 finally. Yep. Oh yeah, that's yeah. happening in January. Yeah. What, what how, what's and, uh, gonna happen? Like, how do you think that's gonna impact the? It's gonna happen. Is it like Y2K? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's gonna happen. So, what do you think is gonna happen when? And uh, from from uh, a token perspective, mm -hmm. I cross my fingers on having uh, regulators at the European level come up with a definition on how you should do a security token offering on a blockchain and have a lighter way of applying the regulation for. Um, security tokens that will follow those recommendations. Uh, I basically s said my core belief. I think it's not going to be super exciting on the STO front. We see a few more probably exchanges pop up and go live, hopefully, fingers crossed. Maybe a few more STOs, but probably next year is not going to be you know, the spectacular year. Things will happen elsewhere. So I think China, if the announcement will come now on Monday, I think about the central bank issued cryptocurrency in China, that's going to really transform um, a lot of things and, and, and change the game uh, and also Libra or Libra like projects I mean Facebook is not the only large tech company that could launch a cryptocurrency or, or a blockchain based currency uh, maybe as a stable coin I think these kind of developments will be I think more exciting even than STO but slowly but surely I think we will grind this to success so the uh, don't don't forget don't think ICOs are dead and STOs are never going to come. ICOs will stay in the game. STOs will come, but at a very slow corporate pace. And, and I think it's going to be for the benefit of the world, and there's going to be lots of good use cases. It's more sustainable and, and a healthy growth. Yeah, cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, now we've got a bit of time for some questions from the audience, because you've heard a lot from um, my panelists. Um, are there any questions? So there's a gentleman over there. I think there's the microphone coming to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to think of the value proposition uh, you mentioned. I'm a securities broker, but I'm trying to think as an investor right now. So if we still need for STOs, institutions of trust like an exchange and uh, PwC doing the auditing and uh, JP Morgan doing the analysis, what's the point? It's exactly what you mentioned. For you, as a security broker, that all sounds as given. You just make a tick box. PwC audits the security. Do you know how much? I'm not an auditor, I'm a strategist, but do you know how much work that is? All the paper trail, all the things that auditors have to check and double check. If you look at a logistics company, that's a hell lot of a work. And I think we're going to get a lot of efficiency gains from an economical point of view by introducing tokens because for us as, as an auditor, an auditor will have a more or less easy job. You know, he's gonna check, um, is the token there? Is it in the wallet? You know, has the key ceremony been done right, et cetera, et cetera. So check the infrastructure, check the token, and then assume that, okay, there's no paper trail behind it because this is what's actually slowing down our economies, the whole paper trail. I mean, we heard about supply chain, logistics, trade finance. If you've been in, the, if you are in that business, you'll be amazed. I mean, they still use fax machines in international. If I, send, if I send a container here from Athens to, let's say, to Antwerp or Rotterdam, you would be amazed how many fax machines are actually going to work on this. And that's the killer app about it. You, as the trader, you will not notice anything. Probably on your screen, it still says, okay, this is, I don't know, the stock of Novartis, and that's the amount, and you will say, oh, that's fine. You know, maybe you'll have a new one, um, you know, uh, block state, or you'll have new, new entries, but for you, not much will change. But everything behind, you know, the, the, in, the, in the belly of the beast, in the engine room, it's gonna change dramatically. 
And your security broker? Is what? Yes. 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 So probably the low hanging fruit, the, the lowest hanging fruit for you will be KYC interoperability with other asset managers and so on. That's a good one. Yeah. So any other questions? Two hands there. Yep. Yeah, him. And then the one at the back later. Uh, good afternoon to all four of you, first of all. Uh, to my poor sense on uh, this specific topic, I think that uh, in digital trends like the example in uh, eSports and the currencies in eSports, I feel like it's uh, quite uh, tempting and maybe quite uh, easy to speculate on uh, trends on these uh, specific, uh, specific uh, topics. Uh, could you please enlighten me with a small hint or an example how to, to solve it or make it uh, more uh, likable to investors? So two, two, two things that I like in eSports, uh, two, two, two big announcements that were done in the past weeks. Uh, Gods and Chain did a very successful distribution of token and he is aiming at being a video game that you can compete on. Um, so a little bit like Hearthstone, if you, if you know the, the, the game right now. Um, and they actually distribute the asset to the user. So they own the asset and will be able to speculate on the asset eventually, but also play with it and, um, and really own the, 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 the asset that they have in games. And another big news from my point of view was uh, uh, the release of Samsung SDK uh, for uh, programming games over uh, the mobile phone. Um, as you may know, in the Samsung S10, you have uh, a hardware wallet in an enclave. Um, so the hardware is getting ready, and um, there are lots of people using Samsung, I believe, in this, uh, in this room. Uh, so pretty soon, you will have your tokens inside your pocket and be able to play games that you can save the token in your wallet and so on. Thank you. Thank you. There was a gentleman with his hand up the back here. Yeah. There's, thanks for the uh, talks and uh, your thoughts on that. Uh, there's a million questions I want to ask. I just want to f let me focus on one of them. You talked about the JP Morgans of the world doing the analysis on uh, things. How do, do you think STOs or the process behind STOs would hinder uh, the Lehman Brothers of the world over inflating markets and then securing um, a global economy. Would that, global economy in the sense, would that at some point be a basis for not allowing values to inflate? Yeah, okay, I, I, I hope I understand the question. So, uh, right, so, so, okay, so the big issue in the financial world and the reason why crypto has been so appealing in the beginning at least was the fact that um, the users retain control over the currency or have some sort of a control because of the decentralization. And when their Lehman Brothers and the JP Morgan of the world come in and issue derivatives and issue, in short, their own financial products to bet against them and then sell those products back to <laughs> financial institutions that kind of your faith in the uh, whole system collapses, right, together with the market. Now. Security token is actually a really cool product, in my mind. Uh, one, because it's directly backed by assets. And um, if this market is transparent to a large extent, and you have players such as BWC and other analysts working together with us to ensure that the assets are actually owned by you know who it says in the, in a in a in a private placement memorandum PPM, and this is a regulated industry, right? So there has to be a legal document attesting to the ownership of the asset and to all of the business model, even like what are you getting? What kind of yields are you expected to get? Together with market reports, right? So this is actually a very very legit industry in this way, especially in the real estate space. Now. As to the ability to create further derivatives or ETFs or funds of funds and other types of products, you know, by these institutions, right? They're going to come in. They're going to realize, wow, this is a gold mine. This is a new product I can take and multiply. It, right? That's what they do. That's what banks and financial institutions do. They take um, like a base product and then they say, well, we can short it, we can future, we can option it, and then we can make 
times 100 on it, right? So um, I don't see that happening with, oh, all right, now I don't see that happening necessarily with security tokens. Um, and, but I think that we should foresee this and maybe even in terms of regulation, kind of prevent some of these things from happening, right? Uh, but, however, you know, because STOs are available to accredited investors directly, you don't have to go to JP Morgan, you don't have to go to a broker to purchase a security token or to trade a security token. As long as you comply, as long as you are uh, the type of investor that can invest in a specific offering, and right now, unfortunately, it's mainly accredited investors uh, globally, if you can invest, you can go directly and you can buy the security token either over the counter or uh, on some exchanges, right? So you don't need stockbrokers. So I see this industry as more promising in terms of the integrity of, of uh, wealth, right? Integrity of wealth generation. I hope that Thank I understood you. the question and answered it. Uh, there's a question at the back over there. Thank you for all this enlightenment about blockchain, which is decentralized. The thing is, as you have said before, that if China is going to move for cryptocurrency and central bank is going to regulate, therefore this decentralized blockchain becomes centralized and regulated. And that's my problem, that that maybe gives a future to blockchain or is not going to give a future and is going to be regulated because China is a very centralized system. And this is worries me about the 2020, because at the moment, maybe the blockchains from 6,000 or 4,000 becomes to 8,000 because you have this announcement, because always you have announcements with Bernanke in the past, and this is how the blockchains and the Bitcoin races and make, make the market. But now that announcement makes me worry because a centralized system like China is going to move from the central banks to legalize that cryptocurrency. What do you think about that? This worries me about the future. Thank you. Anyone want to touch on that also? Yeah, um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a very fair, fair comment. And I think um, I'm not a philosopher, but, but I think your question is a very philosophical one. Where has where decentralization is going to go in the future in this in this thing? Um, I'm probably uh, a bit pessimistic. And of course, there's the argument that even today's world, blockchain world, crypto world is not that decentralized as we sometimes like to think of it. Um, if you look at who controls the protocols, if you look like proliferation of the nodes, etc., and even mining, um, for that matter. Uh, so, and, and then in a proof of stake uh, world, I mean, the protocol becomes even more important because obviously then a lot of counterparties can actually put a stake in. Um, so that looks like it's going to be more decentralized, but factually also there you'll, you'll need to have retain some control over it. But I think that's, uh, you know, the, the future will tell from an economic point of view. Um, I think that's, uh, that's inevitable that uh, a central bank that's going to work on this wants to have to, there's some control. The same is with the STOs. Um, the fact that these exchanges are now jumping in, like the traditional exchanges, um, they will want to have some form of guarantee that you know some authorities will have a crackdown on it if, if required. So if KYC, AML issues arise, um, if it's totally decentralized, all you can do is shrug, you know, like what, what probably was the case three, four years ago in the Bitcoin world. If some wallets belong to some uh, big mafia kingpin, um, that was just the case. And if there was drug money in there from Silk Road, well, that was just the case. But in, in the future world, there will, be, there will be some more centralization, I think, whether we like it or not. Uh, but of course, there are other projects. We heard about uh, David's project uh, earlier, or I think yesterday. There are, of course, other projects that are um, going more into another avenue, more, more decentralization, more privacy protection, etc. Maybe that's going to be the answer for that. So I, I'm, I'm, I would like to try to uh, bring up the regular debate that we have when we talk about decentralization, giving a definition to decentralization is pretty hard. Um, my, my own definition of decentralization in a blockchain context is quite complicated. It is a blockchain, system, a blockchain protocol is decentralized if participating to this protocol requires a reasonably low amount of capital and a reasonably low amount of knowledge. In this case, you can say, well, if I want to participate to the Bitcoin protocol, I can run a miner 
Well, if you want to run a miner, it's actually not that hard, but still hard from some perspective, and it's actually costly if you want to have an ASIC. So, like, saying what is decentralization is actually complicated, but when you mentioned centralization, I think you were more thinking about control, and control itself is already there. Um, the, 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 the more decentralization, from my definition, you have inside the protocol, the harder it is to have control over the protocol, but at the smart contract level, you do whatever you want. So you can, uh, we can see China emitting its own type of smart contract with uh, a private key saying, a private key saying, this is the owner and this owner is Bank of China, so they have all the rights to do whatever. Uh, and from the user perspective, the, re the users, re the users remain in control of their private key. So if they don't want to sign the thing, they can be forced to sign the thing. But if they don't want to participate, they can still opt out and, and not participate. Um, so I, I won't be that worried about China chiming in more. Just a quick comment. Decentralization definitely means different things to different people, but I would view it on a spectrum. And uh, I'll give you an example in our industry, let's say the real estate industry, which has traditionally closed up uh, different investors from coming in. Let's say investors of uh, buy apartment bias of a certain race from coming in and buying apartments in a neighborhood, um, you know, uh, gentrification and other things. Now, blockchain will create a much more fair layer uh, for people to come in. So, you know, while SolidBlock, for example, is a centralized system uh, of, of token distribution, there are certain rules because of the security regulation that you have to abide by to get on the whitelist to buy an asset. So in most places, like I said, you need to be an accredited investor, pass KYC, AML, but that's it. Who you are, what you do, how old you are is not relevant. You can come and you can invest. You can come in, you invest in a trophy asset wherever your heart desires. So that's an example of decentralization for now. I hope that the market is gonna open up to retail investors, so then we even lower uh, barriers even more. Yeah, that's completely, I think, why people that believe in decentraliz in tokenization believe in this model. Like, if, if, I, I, if I want to purchase an apartment, like, you know, it's gonna cost me 100K to, like, the minimum ticket if I wanna own it on my own. If I want to buy a share of a real estate fund, it's going to cost me 5000 something like this. That's the, the entry ticket. Um, so with tokenization of real estate, and that's the beauty of it, I'm able to invest 100 euro eventually in the future into 100 different apartments. And applying portfolio management to those apartments, those flats, is actually very appealing. I think this is the amazing vision. I mean, you can be in a favela in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, or you can be anywhere in Africa, and you can buy a security token that is linked to a real estate in Europe, in France or in Switzerland, for example, which are supposed to be stable real estate markets. That is, that is something you can't do today, unless you ha are very rich and have very good lawyers and very good banks supporting you. But like this, you can ma maybe fractionally, you can just uh, have your month's earning, 100 euros, 200 euros, and just say, okay, I don't want to keep this in cash, I don't want to keep it in bitcoins, I'm going to buy a piece of a apartment in Paris uh, on the Champs-Elysees. I love the Champs-Elysees, I've never been there, but I like the thought of owning something there, and I pay 200 euros, I get a fractional token, and, and I own it. This is something that I think is a, is a too, true vision to aspire to, because today, for the less fortunate in this world, there's no way ever in their life they're gonna be able to do such an investment. And that's, the, that's maybe the, the real shift in paradigm here. It's not from centralization to decentralization, and this narrative of saying, decentralize this, decentralize that, or my project is decentralized Uber, or decentralized, like, it, it doesn't stick compared to the narrative of having an alternative, having your ownership linked to paper on the one hand, and your ownership linked to your public key on the other hand. That's, that's where we are heading, and I believe we can still retain control over uh, this public key. Cool, and on that note, um, we're gonna have to wrap this panel up. Thank you very much for your questions, and thank you very much to the panelists. So if you could give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.